This is the Energy Education Podcast for November 18th, 2012. I'm Kevin Hurley. This podcast is a project of Fairwinds Energy Education. Fairwinds is a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating policymakers, the public, and the next generation on matters of nuclear power and safety. On today's show, we'll discuss the status of the Fukushima Daiichi fuel pools and the progress being made to move the fuel rods to safety. We'll also talk about a recent article published in the Japan Times that looks at high levels of radiation now being found in the freshwater fish of Japan. While we're on the topic of contamination, we'll discuss high levels of radiation found in a dirt sample collected in a Tokyo suburb. Joining us from the road via Skype is Fairwind's chief nuclear engineer, Arnie Gunderson, coming up next. Okay, Arnie, thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, Kevin, I'm glad I could come. Arnie, we've had a lot of listener questions about the status of the fuel pools and the recovery effort at the uh, Fukushima Daiichi site in Japan. Can you just give us a small update? What's going on? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And there there was some important new information uh, out this week that uh, I'd love to talk about. But uh, let's talk at uh, uh, working backward from Unit 4. Unit 4 is a slow but steady progress, and uh, uh, TEPCO is building a box around Unit 4 and pretty much planning on the traditional way of, of removing the nuclear fuel with a with a large overhead crane and a um, uh, with, that can lift as much as 110 tons. Um, that would be the shielded cask that the uh, nuclear fuel would be placed in. You know, uh, Ambassador Akio Matsumura and I have been pushing Tokyo Electric to um, uh, to move much faster, but. Um, they seem to be uh, sort of methodically building a structure that's uh, along traditional lines. Uh, you know, I've said before, if, if there's no earthquake, they'll be able to successfully offload the fuel over the next three, four, five years. And, uh, you know, hopefully, it, we're just, it's a race against time. But if there's no earthquake, Unit 4 could be successfully offloaded with the approach Tokyo Electric's taken. My only problem is they're just moving too slow. So the point of this structure around Unit 4 is to support the crane that will be needed to lift the fuel rods out of the fuel pool. Yeah, there's two... You know, the structure's going to contain the radiation because the fuel is still boiling, the building still is radioactive, so the structure is going to continue to contain the radiation. And then it's also, um, more importantly, strong enough to handle the large crane required to move the nuclear fuel. So a structure being built around Unit 4, both to contain the radiation and to provide the support needed to lift those fuel rods out of the fuel pool as fast as possible. Arnie, what's happening at Unit 3? Uh, yeah, that's where the new information came out from Tokyo Electric, this... Uh, this week. Unit 4, the building under the fuel pool is strong enough to handle the weight of this large crane. They are anchoring the crane to the containment structure in Unit 4. But what happened this week is that Tokyo Electric released a press release and, and the approach on Unit 3 is entirely different than the approach on Unit 4. So they need to get these fuel rods out of the Unit 3 fuel pool. Uh, they're also building a structure. What's different about that? Yeah, they have to get it out, but they can't get it out the same way. Uh, now, Tokyo Electric's not saying that, but uh, in providing details of the drawing for Unit 3, they're, um, they're clearly showing that Unit 3 can't be, um, can't be done as Unit 4 was. And, and therein lies a whole bunch of important analysis. We're putting the, the pictures of the, uh, the uh, Unit 3 structure on the website so, so viewers can follow along here with me uh, as I'm talking. Uh, unit 3 is entirely different than Unit 4. What's different about Unit 3? Well, if you, if you look at the picture, instead of it being the box that's been built over Unit 1 and now being built over Unit 4, they built something that looks like a, um, a superstore in a mall. It's got a bump in the middle of it 
that could easily look like a, a retail outlet. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, when you look at the plant in uh, the drawing that's on page five of the Tokyo press release, they're looking at the side of the structure from the land, looking out toward the ocean. And you see this bump in the middle of the building. Well, that bump is there to allow the nuclear fuel moving equipment to have adequate clearance to pull the nuclear fuel up and out. But more importantly is the picture on page six of the press release that looks at the building from the side. Underneath that bump are large pieces of equipment that need extra clearance so they can pull the nuclear fuel up and down. But when you look at the structure from the side, you'll see that it's not connected at all to the, to the reactor building or to the containment building on Unit 3. And that's a really important distinction. The anchor points on the new structure for Unit 3 are way over on the turbine building, which is on the right side of the picture, and onto the ground, which is on the left side of the picture. What that does is it creates a huge span the gap between the turbine building and the, and the opposite side of the reactor building is very, very long. What that's telling me is that Tokyo Electric cannot lift the 100-ton canisters with the arrangement they're proposing for Unit 3. So you've talked about using smaller canisters before, removing less fuel in one go-around. Is that what you think they're doing now? Yeah, back in September when I was in Tokyo, I, I had a chance to talk to Tokyo Electric in a public meeting. And they said that uh, while they were going to go with the 100-ton cask on Unit 4, that they were considering going with uh, a smaller cask on Unit 3. Now, to my way of thinking, I would have used a smaller cask on Unit 4 because they could have got the job done faster. But they, they obviously knew back then but didn't tell me that the span they needed uh, to, um, to cover on Unit 3 was so large that they couldn't lift a 100-ton canister uh, given the degraded condition of, of Unit 3. And when you say span, what you mean is the area between the supports. So that's the, uh, uh, just like on a bridge uh, between the one end and the other, that's the area that needs to stay, stay suspended in air and be able to lift that much weight. Yeah, that's exactly it, Kevin. We'll make an engineer out of you sooner or later. <laughs> um, so why then do they need a, a longer span on Unit 3? Well, I can't read Japanese, and I have a hunch that Tokyo Electric didn't actually come out and say it. But the, the real problem is that Unit 3 is so severely damaged that it can't handle the weight of a 100-ton of a canister. There's no place in Unit 3 that would be strong enough to, um, uh, to brace heavy crane. So the span then is the area between the two support structures that needs to support the weight of those fuel rods being pulled out with a crane. Um, why such a long span on Unit 3 but not on Unit 4 or Unit 1? Well, the longer the span, the weaker the span uh, for, the, uh, for the amount of metal that they can put into it. I think what it's showing is that the reactor building is not strong enough to handle any of the structural weight of this new modification. You know, I hope that, uh, I, I know we have Japanese viewers, and hopefully some Japanese reporters will listen to this audio and ask Tokyo Electric, why is there a difference between Unit 3 and Unit 4? I think Tokyo Electric is going to say that the reactor building on Unit 3 has been so damaged that we can't find a place to brace the heavy-duty cranes, and therefore we have to span the whole structure. Now that creates a whole bunch of problems, though. A longer span means they can no longer lift this 100-ton cask. When I was in Tokyo, they suggested they had a 50-ton cask that they were considering, and I didn't know why. Now it's, it's absolutely obvious that Unit 3 has been so damaged by the explosion that it can't handle the weight of the larger cask. Now they're not telling people that, but uh, clearly that's what the drawings show. Is this going to slow down the removal of fuel? Absolutely. I I've been saying for about 10 months now 
that the explosion in unit three is entirely different than the explosion in unit um, one or two or four. And I've been saying that it's a detonation shockwave. Um, whether or not it occurred in the fuel pool as a uh, prompt moderated criticality or it occurred as Tokyo Electric seems to still believe as a hydrogen explosion, that's irrelevant. What's important is that it was a detonation, not a deflagration. And this, clear, this, this action by Tokyo Electric on Unit 3 basically admitting that there's no structural member strong enough in Unit 3 clearly shows that a detonation shockwave hit the Unit 3 building. Anything more on that? Well, that has ramifications uh, around the world. Uh, nuclear reactor containments are not designed for a detonation shockwave. And now we know one happened. So, you know, one would think that regulators would redesign containments so that they could handle a detonation shockwave. But uh, instead, at least here in the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission isn't even discussing a detonation shockwave. Um, I, I think if you did you would have to shut down too many nuclear reactors, which is uh, something that, you know, that the NRC doesn't have the stomach to do. Thank you, Arnie. I, I want to switch gears now and talk about a Japan Times article that came out last week, fish contamination. You've long been saying that the radioactive contamination will be working its way up through the food chain. That's something we can expect. Can you talk a little bit about this Japan Times article from last week? Yeah, there was um, uh, trout caught in a, um, in a river in, um, in Fukushima Prefecture. Um, now, this is freshwater fish. You know, uh, all of the, uh, the tuna, for instance, that were caught off of uh, California were, were saltwater fish. But this is a freshwater fish. And the, uh, the concentration of radioactivity in it um, was over 11,000 disintegrations per second in a two-pound piece of, of fish. So... Normally, there'll be a little tiny bit of cesium left over from the bomb program, a couple of disintegrations per second. So this is more than a thousand times more radioactive than background. And, and equally important, it's more than a hundred times higher than the limit set by the, uh, by the Japanese government for cesium in fish. And I think the, the, the important message here that seems to be lost is that um, trout is at the top of the food, the food chain. And you get something called bioaccumulation. So what it's showing me is that the, um, uh, the entire Fukushima prefecture is contaminated with cesium. The cesium is dropping <clears throat> onto the forest floor, getting washed into rivers, where it gets caught in the in the mud, the sediment on the bottom of the um, on the rivers and and uh, and lakes. Well, what happens then is the fish, um, the small fish, eat the the plants that are growing in the sediment. The small fish get eaten by bigger fish, and it works its way up to the trout. This is not a problem that's going to go away. Uh, this is a problem. That, you know, Fukushima Prefecture is as big as the state of Connecticut. Um, and we're basically saying that an area the size of Connecticut is going to be highly contaminated for decades, and that people fishing in the streams and ponds and, um, and, and lakes and dams are going to have to expect to be pulling up radioactive fish for decades to come. Fukushima Daiichi has been leaching radiation into the ocean, but now you're saying that freshwater fish are being affected. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's been crystal clear that 80% of the radiation that uh, um, was released from Fukushima Daiichi after the accident went out into the Pacific immediately. It, it either leaked from the buildings or it was blown through the air and wound up in the Pacific. The other 20% landed on Japan itself. Well, it's going to gradually fall into the mountains. The mountain streams are going to run it into the rivers and out. Now, I was in um, Niigata which is on the Sea of Japan. It's on the west side of Japan. It's almost at the same height as, um, as Fukushima. But there's a mountain range that runs down the center of the, uh, of the island in between. And the rivers and streams in Niigata were, were highly contaminated. The, the sediment, the mud at the bottom of these rivers and streams, 
were highly contaminated with cesium that was coming out of the mountain range in between these two um, um, these two halves of Japan, if you will. Well, what that means is that the radioactive source is now spreading out. Uh, we're not just seeing um, cesium being released from Fukushima Daiichi and the, the leaks into groundwater and the leaks directly into the ocean, but we're seeing all the rivers and streams as they come out of the mountains into the Pacific on the, on the East Coast and into the Sea of Japan on the West Coast are also carrying cesium, um, which is going to work its way up the food chain and contaminate fresh water as well as saltwater fish. Uh, Arnie, is cesium the only isotope being found in these fish? No, that's a really good point, Kevin. Um, if cesium is the easiest one to measure, uh, you can put it into a radiation detector and uh, and you'll pick it up um, quite easily. It, it emits a very distinctive um, energetic um, ray, and, and you can pick it up pretty easily. But when you see uh, cesium levels as high as 11,000 um, becquerels per kilogram, what that means, 11,000 disintegrations per second for every two pounds of, of meat, uh, there's also got to be strontium-90 as well. So strontium-90 is in the bones of the fish. And, um, you know, people say, well, I don't eat the bones, so I don't have to worry about the strontium-90. But the Japanese make stew with fish, and the entire fish is cooked in stew, which then liberates the strontium-90 to then go into uh, them and their kids and, and, and future generations. The difference between cesium and strontium is that cesium is a muscle seeker. It goes to heart muscle, it goes to your body's muscles, and uh, that's why you find it in the meat of a fish, which is muscle. Strontium, on the other hand, is a bone seeker, and it goes to your body's bones, your body's teeth, um, especially in rapidly developing infants. That, that you know, Obviously, your bones are requiring lots of uh, calcium. Strontium is identical to calcium, so that they get, um, it gets absorbed in the bones and is uh, likely to cause um, leukemia. Uh, so it's the, uh, uh, when you see the presence of strontium, um, it's a leukemia uh, precursor. And, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, we're going to see an increase in leukemia as a result of the strontium that plant release. And what might cesium be related to? Well, cesium will cause other cancers, um, not leukemia what they call our tumor uh, cancers are caused by, by cesium. The reason strontium is so hard to detect is because the, the, the ray it emits is, in, is, is quite um, hard to detect. So what chemically has to be done is they have to separate out this, the, the bone and then within the bone they have to separate out the calcium and put it in a detector and look for another isotope called yttrium. Strontium decays to yttrium, which uh, is, is pretty easy to detect. But that whole process takes as long as a month to chemically do the separation and put it in the detector. So you'll hear scientists talk about cesium as if it were the only thing. But in fact, um, it's pretty obvious to me that when you see 11,000 disintegrations per second in, um, in fish, you're also going to see strontium in their bones. So easier to detect cesium. Arnie, what should the Japanese be doing about this right now? Right now, there has to be health warnings out to people who about eating freshwater fish. You know, people that just have uh, as an avocation, uh, you know, fishing in Fukushima Prefecture uh, are very likely to be catching fish that are highly contaminated. But people that um, that need to feed their families by by uh, catching fish. Um, are very likely to be contaminating their families. Now, what the Japanese are, are doing is watching these fish as they go to market, uh, but not all of them, and, and so it's a, it's a random sample. And, um, uh, but I don't believe that the health warnings the Japanese government has put out are adequate considering the numbers we're seeing. You know, well, it's not just the trout. It's, we, we've seen it in, in bass, and we've seen it in, uh, in catfish, um, as well, and not just in Fukushima, but in surrounding prefectures. So the problem is um, is large uh, in in area, and the concentrations are not inconsequential. You know, the 
Japanese government's position here is that uh, don't worry, be happy, um, uh, it's not going to hurt you. And in fact, over time, it is going to hurt a significant number of Japanese, and um, the government's got to step up here and admit that uh, this is a serious health risk. Right. For those of our listeners who are interested in reading that Japan Times article, you can find it under this podcast on the fairwinds.org webpage. Um, moving on, but sticking with the topic of contamination, uh, a few months ago you had taken soil samples in Tokyo and you found high levels of radiation in the Tokyo soil samples. But now some new information that may, may new data, I should say, that may confirm the samples that you took back then. Yeah, our readers may remember when I came back from uh, from Tokyo back in February, I had uh, five samples of, of dirt that I had taken just randomly uh, um, around the city. And um, they were all over 7,000 disintegrations per second in, uh, in a, a two-pound bag. Um, so what that told me was that the releases from the accident were um, were really severe, even as far away as Tokyo. And I said then that if this were contaminated ground at a nuclear power plant, it would have to be considered as nuclear waste. Well, we took a lot of flack for that on the Fairwind site, but uh, we were right on the mark. What just happened um, just, just last week was that uh, in a suburb of Tokyo, uh, another sample was taken by citizens, and they brought it to the attention of the government that then sampled it. Um, but basically, they had a hot spot that was in excess of 10,000 disintegrations per second per kilogram of their sample. So here we are nine months after I took my samples, and citizens are still finding hot spots all over the Tokyo area. I think it speaks to, uh, one, the magnitude of the initial release. This was a a serious release, not just for Fukushima Prefecture, but for Tokyo and its suburbs as well. Tokyo is 130 miles away. This is not uh, around the corner. These high concentrations detected in Japan really speak to emergency planning elsewhere. I mean, Tokyo is 130 miles away from uh, Fukushima, and here's New York City, 26 miles away from Indian Point. Or, you know, L.A. is 50 miles away from the, uh, the San Onofre reactors. So if Tokyo could be highly contaminated to the point where its soil should be shipped to a nuclear waste dump, what should the United States be doing when we've got nuclear plants that are much closer than, than Tokyo was to Fukushima? The, Tokyo from, to Fukushima is 130 miles, and here L.A. is 50 miles from San Onofre, and New York City is, a, is 26 miles away from Indian Point. If Tokyo can have soil so hot that it should be shipped to a radioactive dump, what might happen to our nation's capital, the biggest city in the United States, or to L.A. in the event of a nuclear accident? We're really not prepared, and we'll, we have our policymakers at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have not even envisioned that as a possibility. All interesting information, Arnie. I want to also remind our listeners that this Wednesday we'll be publishing a special edition podcast to talk about issues happening within the United States. Arnie, could you just give us a little preview of Wednesday? There's a lot going on in the United States that would make this podcast way too long. Um, there's uh, issues um, related to losing the ability to cool the nuclear reactor in the event of an accident. Uh, we call that loss of an ultimate heat sink. Um, there's been containment damage detected at a couple of nuclear reactors now. Uh, the, the biggest problem on the horizon is cost. Uh, several nuclear reactors now have announced that they are considering permanently shutting down because the cost to keep them running is um, is just too high. So we'll address all of that over Thanksgiving turkey at uh, the, in the middle of the week.